Wow, good morning, Cities Church. Great to be with you here today. Uh, we have come to Psalm 55. Uh, this Psalm 55 has some overlap with the previous Psalm, Psalm 54, that we looked at last week that Pastor Jonathan preached from, and some overlap between this Psalm and the next two Psalms as well, Psalm 56 and 57. And so there are several similarities between 54 and 55. The, the, the main one I'd like to highlight this morning is one that Pastor Jonathan highlighted in chapter 54 last week, and that is the fact that, that David in this psalm is modeling for us what it looks like to preach to yourself. All right, so remember last week Pastor Jonathan talked about uh, prayer, talked about uh, preaching and praise. And David models that for us in these Psalms. But in this Psalm 55, we especially see himself, we see him preaching to himself in a way that we can learn from and follow. And so we're going to look at Psalm 55 with that in mind this morning. Let's pray and then we'll dive into the text. Father in heaven, you are so kind to us, so, so kind. Every time I think about your kindness, I'm blown away. It is remarkable. God, thank you. Thank you. Now I ask that you would be pleased to use your word this morning in this sermon to edify your people. Those of us here that know you and love you, may the truths we see in this psalm comfort us, give us strength, and may they inspire us to be more committed to gospel mission when we walk out of this place. May the, the truth we see in this psalm edify us and inspire us and provoke us toward holiness. I pray that for every single one of us, that we would walk out of this place more confident in your sustaining love and your care for us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, in the opening verses of Psalm 55, David is lamenting. He's crying out to God in the first few verses we see here. And it becomes very apparent that David is in a very painful situation. There is some really bad stuff happening to him. Look, look at verses 1 and 2 with me. He says this, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea of mercy. Give your ear to my prayer, O God, he says. Verse two, he says, attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and I moan. He's crying out to God. He's expressing this, this, this moaning, this, this current state he is in. And he's asking God, would you be attentive to me? He's asking God, would you listen to me? Please give me the confidence to know that you are indeed listening. And then he begins to communicate a sense of desperation, why he desperately wants God to listen to him. He, he launches into this desperate explanation in verse 3. He says this, because of the noise of my enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble upon me. There's an enemy in my midst. There's some noise. There's some ruckus. There is chaos. I've got trouble and oppression coming my way. Oh God, I need you to listen to me now. Look at verse 4. He says this, my heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. There is anguish inside of me. The, the terror of death, the possibility of death is is right at my doorstep. Verse 5, he says this, fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. David is overwhelmed by a sense of fear that the trouble and oppression coming his way just might get him. He says, horror overwhelms me. This is vivid language that David is using here. So apparently there's some group of people 
Uh, There is some dispute amongst Bible scholars as to precisely what group David is referring to here, but there's some group of people that are coming at David, they're trying to chase him down, or they're coming after him, they're bringing oppression and trouble, and David is afraid. He says, I've got anguish in my heart. This is intense. Now, there's something interesting we see in these verses, and then the next few verses, we see something in David that's a little bit unique than what we typically see. When you examine the first few verses of Psalm 55 here, you pick up on David's tone, which is a little bit different than what we typically see from David most of the time. We, we pick up here that he is feeling quite anxious. He's overwhelmed, he's afraid, he's unsettled, he's frazzled, horrified, maybe feeling insecure. There's a lot of emotions that we pick up on in David in this moment. It's sort of like he's saying, it's not going well and I'm afraid that I'm going to die very soon. But this is not normal, this is not the norm of what we pick up on in David. Even in moments where David typically is lamenting, David still often speaks with a sense of confidence that God is going to hear his prayer. It is not, it is not common that we hear this sort, of, this sort of lack of courage or lack of confidence from David. Now, elsewhere in the Psalms, we see David speaking very confidently about God listening to him, even in the midst of suffering, right? In in Psalm chapter 4, Psalm 4, David says, the Lord hears me when I call to him. It's pretty clear. In Psalm 33, he says this, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. He, He knows, listen, I fear God and his eyes are on me, he says in Psalm 33. In the next Psalm, Psalm 34, David says this, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. He hears, or his ears are toward their cry. So there are moments we see in the Psalms where David, even in the midst of of pain or suffering, he still is very confident that God is hearing him. But there are these other moments in the Psalms that, that are less frequent, these moments where David is speaking and you get the sense that he's not so confident. We, we get the sense that in these rare moments, anxiety has gotten the best of David. John Calvin, the great 16th century pastor theologian, in his commentary on Psalm 55, he picks up on this and he, he comments. Here's, here's what Calvin says. He says, from the language with which the psalm opens, we may conclude that David at this time was laboring under heavy duress. It could be no ordinary duress. <clears throat> or no ordinary amount of duress, because it produced such an overwhelming effect upon David. And this is how Calvin describes David, a saint of distinguished courage. So Calvin, one of the greatest comment- commentators ever, is saying, usually when we read David, even in the midst of pain and suffering, we see a sense of distinguished courage in this man that we don't see here in Psalm 55. He, he, the, the trademark distinguished courage that we typically see in David is missing, which means whatever David is facing in this moment is especially bad, which is remarkable when you consider the, the life and narrative and resume of David. That man faced a lot of difficult moments, but this is an especially difficult moment for David. And, when, and as we read throughout the rest of the psalm, as, as Daniel just read for us a moment ago, we see that David is explaining why this moment is so difficult for him, why the pain seems to cut deeper this time than in other moments. He gives these vivid and intense descriptions of the anguish he is feeling, and there's this sense of devastation you get from David as we read through these verses. It's almost as if there's been some violence done to his soul. And he is trying to help us understand the pain he is seeing or feeling. From verses 6 through 11, we we won't read them for time's sake, but verses 6 through 11, David is talking about this group of wicked people that are after him, and they are wreaking havoc on the city. They're causing strife, and they're bringing with them trouble. 
in verse 9, he actually asked God to divide their tongues, which is, is likely a, a reach back to Genesis chapter 11, where the Tower of Babel takes place. Right there. In the book of Genesis, there's this moment where people are conspiring to bring, uh, to, do, to do an evil thing, and God scatters their languages. And it seems like David is saying, you did it once before, could you do it again? This evil that's happening is just as bad as that evil. Oh God, would you step in and confound their speech? Would you step in and divide their tongues, he says in verse 9. So David is in essence saying, God, this is really bad. Would you hold these men accountable? But then in verse 12, it shifts a bit. We see a shift for David in verse 12. <clears throat> and we pick up on why this moment for David is actually especially bad. We pick up on this here. Look at verse 12 and 13 with me. David says, for it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals in, <clears throat> um, insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. He's like, if the leader of this wicked group of men were someone I didn't know, maybe a military general from another country attacking us or, or some enemy of mine, I could probably put up with it. But, but it, it appears that the, the, the primary leader or one of the primary leaders of this wicked group of men coming after David is someone that David at one point was very close friends with. David's like, I could handle if it was a stranger coming at me, but not you. He says, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. This is a moment where David is feeling betrayed. He is feeling desperately hurt because someone he once trusted and loved has now turned on him. When I was studying this week through this psalm, I was thinking about different betrayals that have happened in literature or pop culture. And the one that always stands out to me is from William Shakespeare's famous play, Julius Caesar. Right? Julius Caesar is, the, is in the Roman Senate, and the senators there conspire to kill, and eventually they stab and assassinate Julius Caesar there in the Roman Senate. And you can get the sense that, that Caesar knows these guys are my political enemies, so maybe he's not entirely shocked that these guys would come at him. But then he sees Brutus, his friend, his protege, and, and William Shakespeare writes that, that as Brutus was a part of this, Caesar looks at Brutus and says, et tu Bruti, translates, and, and even you, Brutus? Now, historians have told us this actually didn't happen. William Shakespeare made it up. But who's going to allow facts to get in the way of a good story, right? That's not relevant. It's, it's this great epic moment where Caesar, where this friend Brutus, and Brutus, said, Brutus is, is in on this plot to kill Caesar, and Caesar is just devastated, heartbroken by the betrayal. Even you, Brutus? Even you? Another one I thought of this week was toward the end of the Hunger Games series. Where Katniss Everdeen realizes that she's been betrayed by President Coyne. The, the, Katniss Everdeen fights this war. She's loyal to President Coyne. She helps President Coyne get into power, and President Coyne turns on them and makes various decisions that leads to the death of Katniss's younger sister, whom Katniss loved so much. And you see in Katniss's face, the absolute heartbreak and betrayal. I was loyal to you. I helped you get to where you are. And you would turn on me in this way? You would cause this sort of pain to me in this manner? That's sort of the emotions you get from, from David here in this psalm. And he describes this friend that turned on him in this way. Look at verse 20. Skip down to verse 21 for a moment. This is how he describes this friend that turned on him. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. Now we're getting a good picture of a man who was quite malicious. He was smooth like butter, and yet war was in his heart. That's what David says about this man. Oof, right? Some of us have experienced this sort of heartbreak in our lives. Some of us have experienced betrayal from a friend, 
uh, a family member, a spouse. Some of us have experienced deep, deep betrayal. Just a few months ago, I I had a relational fracture with someone I was very close to for many years and still working to reconcile that. But I was devastated, deeply hurt by something someone did to me several months ago. And I thought about all the times that man sat on my couch and drank my Diet Coke. At the Ortiz residence, there's always a supply of Diet Coke if you're a Diet Coke fan. And I, I thought to myself the, the, the pain I felt every time I think about those moments. I once had fond memories with this person, and now all I can think about is the pain that was caused. It, it overshadows all of the good memories, and David is talking about this. And certainly many of you have experienced those sorts of things, where you once had fond memories of a relationship or a group of people, but because of the events that have taken place, that now is overshadowed by pain. David begins to talk about this group of men. In verse 15, he says this, let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. There is evil in the hearts of these men. May they suffer the eternal consequences they righteously deserve. He reiterates this in verse 23. If you look at verse 23, he says this, but you, O God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. David's like, listen, these men who are wicked, doing this wicked thing, I know God is going to cast them down. God will hold them accountable, accountable eternally for the actions they have chosen, the direction they have gone down. David is reminding himself of this. And the reason this is important for David to acknowledge this, because if you're in David's shoes, it would be very easy to allow bitterness to grow in your heart. It would be very easy to see these wicked men, these evil men doing evil things, causing strife and wreaking havoc on the city, coming at David, seeing this, this pr previous friend of his coming at him. It would be easy to see their seemingly successful movement in the city and think, God, are you going to do anything about this? Are you going to do anything about this evil actions right in front of me? It seems like no one is holding them accountable. God, are you going to do it? Are you still listening? Are you still watching what is happening? So it is valuable for David to remind himself, yes, while I may not see justice in this world the way I want to see it, I know that God does see everything. His ear is attentive. And when we go into eternity, these men will indeed face the consequences they deserve. I can trust in God that he will handle it as he sees fit. And I am free to let it go and not be bitter or not try to take matters into my own hand. Here as we see, David is preaching to himself. He's reminding himself. Because he knows it would be easy, he would be tempted to take matters into his own hands or to be bitter, to try to get revenge, but to go, I don't have to do that because God's going to throw them down into the pit when God sees fit to do so. In his timing, in his way. I don't have to worry about that. Here's what I have to worry about. My own soul. Is what he says in verse 16. But I call to God and the Lord will save me. I'm not going to worry about those men. God's going to take care of that. May they go to Sheol alive. May they suffer the consequences of their evil. That's for God to take care of. But I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to trust God. And here's what I know will happen. He is going to save me. He is going to save me. David knows these evil men will face judgment. But he will be saved. Not because he's the most morally upright character in the Bible. Because he's not. Not because he's a better father or a better husband than those men. Not because he's the anointed king. Not for any of those reasons. God is going to save David for one reason and one reason only. Because he has trusted in God. David knows that. That is true for David and it's true for us as well. God will save you. But not because of anything you've done or not done. But for only one reason. If you trust in him. If you trust him. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 10. He says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. David knows this. He preaches it to himself as a means of releasing potential bitterness. And we can do the same. We can do the same. He continues to preach to himself throughout the rest of Psalm 55. You get the sense that David is he's reminding himself and others who would read this the truth that should inform how he approaches this. He's specifically reminding himself of the goodness of God. And this is the model that I want us to take away. When we are preaching to ourselves, when we are reminding ourselves of the truth in Scripture, one of the greatest areas to focus in on is the goodness of God. Is what he says in verse 17. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and I moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety. When I come to the Lord and I moan, I complain, I lament, I cry out, he hears me, and he redeems my soul in safety. He's got me. He's got my back. He's listening to me. He's watching. I can trust in him. And what you get as this psalm progresses throughout Psalm 55, the confidence that is so normal to David seems to kind of be back on the scene. Earlier in the psalm, he he seems more insecure, more overwhelmed, less confident, less courageous. But as he preaches to himself, as he reminds himself of the goodness of God, his confidence in God and his courage to approach God seem to elevate. There's a correlation there. The more often we preach to ourselves the goodness of God, the more confident we will be in the goodness of God. You sense from David here that his confidence is returning, that he's no longer shaken because he's reminded himself of truth. And the same is true for us. As we remind ourselves of truth, as we preach to ourselves and to each other, we regain confidence, even in the moments of our lives that are chaotic or painful. We can be confident in God's willingness and ability to save us. Jesus says this in John 6, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. You can be confident in God's goodness, both his willingness and ability to save you. The apostle Peter says this in 1 Peter 5, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Peter's saying, humble yourself, because if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. He will take care of you. But if we refuse to humble ourselves, God will then forcibly humble us. Those who humble themselves experience the goodness of God. Those who who refuse to humble themselves will face accountability before a holy and righteous God. This is what David says about those men in verse 19 here in Psalm 55. He says this, God will humble them. Those men may not want to humble themselves, but there's going to come a moment where God will humble them. Friends, there's coming a day where you will be humbled before God. If you do it today, if you do it before judgment day, you will then experience the mercy of God. But if that day comes, that day of reckoning comes and you've not humbled yourself, that day will not go well for you. James chapter four says this, James is quoting from the book of Proverbs. He says this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. The last verse we'll look at here in Psalm 55 this morning is Psalm 22. This is sort of the the key verse in this passage. David has given us tremendous insight into the pain he's feeling, the anguish that is in his heart. He has shared his anguish. He's talked about his anxieties, his fear, this deep hurt and betrayal at the hands of a friend. But he continues to preach to himself rather than allowing the circumstances to shape how he thinks, he looks to the truth about God. In verse 22, he says this, cast your burden on the Lord. He will sustain you. Cast your burden on the Lord. 
He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. If you are a believer in Jesus this morning, you are righteous. You've been counted righteous. This applies to you. If you cast your burdens on the Lord, all of your insecurities and anxieties and fears and moments where you feel overwhelmed or horrified, if you take those burdens and you put them on the Lord, He will sustain you. He will give you strength and grace. Uh, another English translation, actually a paraphrase of this verse, Psalm 55, 22, goes like this. Pile your troubles on God's shoulders. He'll, he will carry your load. He will help you out. Pile your troubles on God's shoulders. He will help you. Can you imagine the loads we carry? I think about this as my 14-month-old daughter is getting bigger and heavier. She was once small and squishy and easy to carry, and now she's less squishy and a little heavier. It takes a little more muscle, right? And then every now and then someone will come to me and say, oh, oh can I hold her? Yeah, and I, I hand her off, and instantly, oh, okay, I don't have to hold up another human now. I'm, I'm now, I, mean, I love holding her, it's a joy, but you know what, my muscles sometimes can hurt a bit. That's the imagery we're getting here. The, the, the things you're carrying, hand them over to God. He's better at carrying stuff than you are. We pile our troubles on his shoulders. He will sustain us. We see similar language from the Apostle Peter again, 1 Peter 5, verse 7. He says this, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Peter is telling Christians, cast your anxieties, those moments of fear, those moments where you feel overwhelmed or horrified, all of those burdens you carry, take them and hand them to the Lord. And do you know why you can hand them to him? Because he cares for you. He cares. He loves you more than your kids or your mama or your spouse or your dog. He cares for you. God cares about you. He knows everything about you, and He cares for you. In Matthew 10, Jesus tells us that the hairs on our head are numbered. I know for some people that's maybe like, oh, that's pretty easy to do, but you get the imagery. Think about all the hairs that you have, right? It's like, wait a minute. He knows every single hair on every single person's head. He cares. Church, the reason you can trust God and put your anxieties on Him, the reason you can hand your anxieties and cast them upon the Lord is because He cares for you. He loves you with a fierce, passionate love far beyond what you could ever possibly understand. Church, He cares for you. Maybe you're burdened because of a relational fracture or someone betrayed you. Maybe you're wounded. Maybe you're facing a family crisis right now of some sort. Maybe you're facing a disease or a, a difficult prognosis. Maybe a, a hard relationship with a child. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe there's some financial hardship in your family. Maybe there's some difficulty at work. Maybe you're have wrestled with years of infertility or miscarriages, mental health, loneliness, feeling misunderstood, exhaustion. There are a whole host of things that cause us to feel anguish, to feel, to feel alone in this life. You can put all of them on Him because He cares for you. He cares. Your God cares for you. Almost every Sunday morning here at City's Church, every Sunday morning we come here and we do a, a welcome at the beginning of the service like we did today. And most weeks we often read from Matthew 11. So I'm going to read those words to you this morning. Matthew 11:28. 28, Jesus speaking. He says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. 
Jesus invites you to come to him with your burdens. He says, is it heavy? Has life been hard? Has it been difficult? Come to me. I will give you rest. Jesus will give us rest. The apostle Peter says this in 1 Peter 3.12. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayer. Church, his eyes are on you. His ear is set, inclined to you. The frequency that you're sending out, he is tuned into it and waiting to listen to your laments and complaints and frustrations. He says, bring me those burdens. I will give you rest. That's the Jesus that we serve. Many of us have faced all sorts of difficulties and deep hurt. Some of us have experienced things maybe similar to what David is writing about here in Psalm 55. And in those moments, we can cast our burdens on him. He promises to sustain us in Psalm 55. And in 1 Peter 5, he says, you can cast your burdens on, 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 uh, on him because he cares. I want to close this morning with just two points of application. I want to give you kind of two things to consider. When, when you are carrying anxiety, when you are in the moment of pain and suffering or chaos or difficulty, when you feel alone or misunderstood or you're trying to navigate a difficult situation, you're not sure what to do, or you and your spouse are arguing, you're, you're at each other's throats, when you're facing any burden of any kind, I want you to do these two things. I'm going to give you two things to do and then we'll go to the table. The first thing is this, when you're facing any anxiety or burden of any kind, First, go to God in prayer. First. Going to people is great. Your spouse, your boss, maybe a therapist or a counselor, your pastors, your community group. There's a whole host of people in your life you could go to when you're facing things. And you should do that. Yes. However, my encouragement to you, my exhortation to you would be go to God in prayer first. Before you talk about it, go pray about it. That sounds simple and trivial, but I can't tell you, it's a, there's a very high percentage of time when someone comes to me and they, they talk about a problem they're facing, and I ask them, how much time have you spent in prayer? Have you taken this to the Lord? And the answer is almost always either no or very little. Go to God first. This is David's inclination here. He's facing a situation and he cries out to God, God, would you hear me? He doesn't run to Facebook or Twitter or TikTok. He runs to the Lord. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, let your requests be made known to God. Don't be anxious about anything. Instead, go to him in prayer with thanksgiving in your heart, with gratitude, because you know who he is, and you're thankful for all that he is and all that he has already done and all that you know he will do. You go to him with thankfulness in your heart, and you make your request known to him. And here's what will happen. Verse 7, Paul says this, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you want the peace of God to flood your life, to flood your soul, to guard your heart and mind? That peace of God that transcends all understanding in this world. Do you want that? Here's what you do. You go to God in prayer with thanksgiving in your heart. You make your requests known to him and the peace of God will guard your mind and heart. The second thing I want you to do is this, when you're carrying anxieties, when you're facing a painful situation, I want you to do what David has modeled for us, preach to yourself. Preach to yourself. David has modeled this for us in these Psalms. So often we have the right information in our brains. We we got the right data, the right information, the right theology, it's all here, but so often we, we, we don't get from our brains to our hearts. It doesn't sink into our souls. It's knowledge we've got, but it's not a felt reality. When I was in high school, way back in the 1990s, a pastor of, my, of the church I was a part of for many years would often say, 
the, the longest distance in all of the universe is the 18 inches between the head and the heart. And the way we, the way we solve that is that we immerse ourselves in truth. You got the right theology, the right data, the right information, great. Now, remind yourself of that truth over and over and over again. Practically speaking, this will look different for every person. Sometimes that means you're facing a burden or an anxiety or a painful moment. That means you're going to go uh, look, go listen to a sermon. Maybe you pull out the City's Church app on your phone or you go to the YouTube, our YouTube channel and you go listen to a sermon from one of our pastors that will encourage you in the midst of that painful situation. Or maybe in other moments that means you, you go put on a song, right? You go put on some worship song, download one of the 10,000 billion songs available on the internet and you go worship. Right in that moment. Sometimes that means you want to quote scripture. So memorize scripture and quote it out loud. And if you don't have it memorized, get some three by five cards and write those verses out and put them on your mirror in your bathroom, put them in the dashboard of your car, put them on your cubicle at work, put them in your pocket. And anytime that those thoughts flood your mind, when the pain and the, the fear, the anxiety floods your soul, get those three by five cards out and read the word of God out loud those anxieties will subside. They will flee. They may come back three seconds later when you read the verse again, and you read the verse again, and you keep reading it, and you keep quoting it. Go, go find a few verses, memorize them, quote them out loud, because the Word of God is one of the most powerful gifts and instruments that, that God has given us for our own comfort, strength, grace, and edification. When certain thoughts pop in your brain, and that emotion arises in your heart, Go to God's word. Memorize some, or write them down, and read them out loud. The Bible tells us that we can cast our burdens on the Lord because he cares for us. And he has promised to sustain us. Go to him in prayer and preach to yourself daily, every single day. Daily remind yourself God cares for you. Daily remind yourself that your redemption is not because of something you did, but because of what Christ did on your behalf. Daily remind yourself that you are a sinner deserving of hell, but God intervened and made a way for you to be saved. Daily remind yourself that God became a man, lived a perfect life. He was condemned in our place, died the death that we should have died. Daily remind yourself, as the prophet Isaiah says, that the suffering servant, Jesus, the righteous one, was treated as if he is unrighteous, so that those of us who are unrighteous can be counted righteous. I remind myself of that almost every day. I quote from Isaiah, almost every day I remind myself, you were unrighteous, but the righteous one was treated as if he is unrighteous so that I could be counted righteous. Every day I remind myself of that. Daily remind yourself that God has placed your sins on Jesus Christ at the cross. And at the cross, Christ paid the price for your sins so that you can then have friendship with God. The God who cares for you. Remind yourself of that every day. Preach to yourself every single day. And one of the things we do around here corporately every Sunday is we come to this table. And at this table, it's an action that preaches to us. J just in case you went all week and you forgot to think about the fact that Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead, we want you to come to this table to be reminded, may this action preach to you that the God of the universe cares for you so much that he intervened and made a way for you to be rescued from the judgment and wrath of God. We come to this table every week to preach to ourselves that the God who cares for us made a way for us to be saved. So in just a moment, our pastors are going to come. They're going to serve the bread first. We'll pass it out, hold it. I'll come back and lead us in taking it together. The bread reminder is, a, is all gluten-free. This meal is primarily for members of City's Church, but it is open to anyone here who's a believer in Jesus. If you are here and you would say, I have genuinely trusted in Christ, then we welcome you to participate in this meal and to remember what Christ did on your behalf, that he did it 
because he cares for you. If you are here this morning and you're not a believer, if you say, I'm not sure I've genuinely trusted in Christ, then I would encourage you when the bread and the wine come, just let it pass by. Do not participate. But don't let the moment pass. Instead of taking communion with us, take Christ this morning instead. And if you have any questions of what that means, what that looks like, I'll be up here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to, to believe on Jesus. I'd love to talk to you about that. <clears throat> Cities Church, God cares for you. Let's remember what he did for us at the cross. His body is the true bread. Let us serve you.